Just um, ID everybody here. Just go ahead and say your names, and we'll. This is the. Uh, and my name is Arnold Hirsch. And I'm Connie Atkinson. That's Eric Hardy. We're interviewing Jacques Moriel today. I'm Jacques Moriel. Good. Okay. The man in the hot seat. Uh, this is part of the Board of Regents interview um, um, project on the Ernest Dutch Moriel and his mayoralty. And uh, today we're interviewing another member of the family, Jacques Moriel, on uh, the life and uh, the election, the first election of Ernest Dutch Moriel. Um, we, are, we will be asking um, questions uh, building up to the, uh, to the election, but also uh, questions about the family um, and intimate things mm -hmm. that were told about uh, election politics during that period. And I think, uh, do you want to help with this? Sure. Okay. And uh, Dr. Hirsch will ask some questions, and then uh, Eric Hardy and I will ask them additional questions. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Is that going to be loud enough? That's good. And after you ask a question, you can set it down on, the, oh, great. on the book here or whatever. Just, just hold it to ask the question. Yeah. Yeah, just sit there. Okay. Uh, I don't know if this qualifies as a uh, political dynasty mm -hmm. or not, but in terms of local politics in most American cities, it is certainly a family with a long political mm -hmm. history. Uh, what is your earliest political memory uh, in the family, whether it's a dinner table conversation or a campaign? or When did you first become aware of the role of politics in this family? I guess it was probably um, in the 60s, uh, my dad's first race in 1967 for the state legislature. It was ultimately took office in 68. And that's when I think I became aware of um, electoral politics in a, on a first-hand kind of basis. Um, you know, I worked um, lots of campaigns, of course, since then, but that was uh, the first where I actually remember what happened inside of a campaign and all of the people that were involved and the roles that they played. How old were you at that time? I think I was uh, six or seven. And then um, the following year uh, was a presidential election year, 1968. And um, Humphrey was running against Nixon. And I remember that we organized uh, some of the kids in our neighborhood to work for Humphrey to hold up signs and to canvas the neighborhood. Now your dad, if I recall, was a delegate to the Chicago Convention? He sure was, yeah. Did he come home with any stories? Uh, well, lo that? lots of stories. I mean, I think we were um, very young at the time, but the uh, unrest at the convention in a lot of ways unsettled us because it was um, historic that uh, my parents had attended the convention as uh, delegates and participants. I don't think uh, before that time there had ever been any African-American delegates to, from Louisiana to Democratic convention. So your mother was a delegate also? Yeah, I think so. I think well, so. Yeah. No, no, he just attended. Yeah. He attended. Mm -hmm. And was there any attempt to blame the convention riots on Memorial Presence? No, not at all. <laughs> no. <laughs> I was there on the other end, so I just thought I would look dead in there. Um, but, lo I, you know, I imagine a lot of the same things were going on as, you know, you've studied a great deal about in Chicago around that time as in New Orleans. So you do have political memories going back to age six or seven. Mm -hmm. uh, did politics or civic affairs, public affairs, uh, play uh, much of a, a role in your lives, uh, either in uh, daily conversations mm -hmm. or this was just something mm -hmm. that was in well, the air? Well, I think civic affairs and civic commitment was something that we were always aware of. You know, my parents, in addition to their um, their jobs, their professional obligations. They had a lot of, a lot of civic commitments. They uh, went to and hosted a lot of meetings, um, a lot of you know fairly meetings that um, for us as children seemed to be very important. Uh, the adults were discussing things of, of great gravity, um, and I remember that you know from a, a much earlier age, from the age of four or five. And do you re remember? Uh whether or not uh, these kinds of activities embraced uh, 
more or less African American institutions and organizations, or were they were there any uh, cross race? Well, there were both. I think that um, um, some of the earliest I remember were um, civic organizations in the African American community, but um, there were a lot of uh, interracial sorts of uh, uh, meetings and groups, and I think. Uh, that was something that um, we were always aware of, but it wasn't anything that we found particularly peculiar or special. But it wouldn't have been unusual for you to notice your parents interacting with whites? No, 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 not at all, not at all. Even though, um, you know, at the time we lived in a, a segregated middle class uh, subdivision, Punch and Train Park, and just a few blocks away was a comparable white subdivision, Gentilly Woods. Uh, we attended an integrated uh, Catholic school, but the neighborhoods themselves uh, were were segregated. Did you ever encounter firsthand any uh, racial difficulties in attending these integrated institutions? Sure, but I mean, it wasn't anything that um, it wasn't a you know a life changing or impacting event or anything like that. It was, I think, the atmosphere that uh, we grew up in, you know. The really the post Voting Rights Act civil rights era between the in my case the uh, early mid 60s through the late 70s the, the atmosphere was particularly different and I think there was a lot of um, a new resentment and fear among um, whites especially in New Orleans about what the new changes might bring. Now you said your earliest political memory stemmed from that legislative race mm -hmm. your father made. As I recall, it may have been after his election, but before he took his seat, there was some incident in front of his campaign headquarters on mm -hmm. Magazine mm -hmm. Street. Uh, did that involving uh, some local police officers mm -hmm. who uh, mistaken or not known his identity? Did that have any impression uh, on you or the family? How, how did that? Oh yeah, it did. Um, my father and um, one of his uh, oldest friends, Henry Desjois, were standing on the street in front of um, our family's apartment that uh, my dad kept on Magazine Street. And they had just attended a, um, a fundraiser for, I think, Governor McKithen. Uh, and they were on the street um, exchanging pleasantries about to part ways and the police came up and suggested to him that they had to leave. and. My dad suggested that he didn't think he had to leave. He was in front of his own home. And the police officer said, well, we're going to go around the block, and if you're here when we come back, you're going to jail. He said, well, I live, I live here. I don't think I'm going anyplace. And um, police, as he promised, made the block and came back and arrested both my dad and Henry Desjois for loitering and some other harassment charges. Um, but it did. Um, it was uh, not a wake-up call, but it did really remind us that uh, my dad's election or elevation to an office or position of public trust really um, was only one small step, that it was really just the opening of a, challenge, a chapter of challenges. And that the uh, relationship with the New Orleans Police Department and New Orleans citizens could mm -hmm. be uh, at times a, a rocky relationship. Well, it. You know, the New Orleans Police Department has a, a, a long history of um, uh, police brutality and, uh, I guess, hostility in response by some quarters of the community. And um, I don't remember a whole lot of that atmosphere in the, in the 60s, but um, uh, we always could relate to um, instances where people had been victims of not only police brutality, but harassment and abuse of judgment by police officers. When uh, was it that you took your first very active role in one of your father's political campaigns? Uh, I don't think it was until um, his uh, race in 1977. I remember the 69 race for, um, for city council, but I was still young. I think I was eight or nine years old at the time. But um, in the, the 77 race for mayor, um, it was a, a massive citywide campaign. It was more of a movement than a campaign, and there was a, there was a whole lot to do, and we were, I don't think that we had ever really, African Americans had not been responsible for running and managing a citywide uh, campaign in New Orleans. Um, I think Ed Lombard and a couple of others had been elected to citywide office, but always under the patronage and uh, 
um, direct involvement of a, a, a substantial and powerful white politician. So we had never been really responsible for running a citywide race, so we had to make it up as we went along. And we were, you know, chronically short of resources. We really didn't have any money. Was the family the core of that campaign organization? Mm. I, I wouldn't say so. I mean, my brother and I were actively involved, and of course my mother was. Um, but the campaign organization was really uh, much, much larger than that, and it included some of my father's uh, associates in legal practice and some of his um, protégés in, in the legal profession, uh, and some of his lifelong friends and people who, who he had worked with in civic organizations. Who so. do you remember as being most instrumental in that campaign? Hmm. Well, it's hard to say. I wouldn't uh, venture to name any one person, but uh, Paul Valto was the campaign chairman, and he, you know, played a vital role in really kind of um, keeping all of the competing factions and interests within this campaign together. I mean, there were um, the church groups, there were the um, the sort of civic groups, there were the um, the white liberals and the white sort of uh, business moderates. I mean, so there were a lot of competing interests that all um, not only had an interest in my father's candidacy, but had an interest in how the campaign was run, and everybody had their own ideas about how everything should be done. And what was it that you did in connection with that campaign? Well, I did whatever I was asked. I was uh, 16 at the time, so I did everything from um, um, knocking on doors, manufacturing, yard signs to telephone banking. We even had a, 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 a volunteer tracking pole that was operated by volunteers and I did some work on that but um, pretty much anything that the campaign needed you know the, as I said it was we were building an, a, a citywide campaign and organization out of nothing. Um, so it was you know held together by um, paper clips and, and spit. What was your uh, perception of uh, some of the other black political mm -hmm. groups and organizations mm -hmm. that had either uh, withheld support or mm -hmm. uh, had leaders who had, had their own ambitions? Well, I, had, I was aware, I, you know, I became aware of these organizations, I guess, back in the 69 campaign um, because they were actively involved in the runoff battle between uh, Fitzmaurice and Landrieu. And um, at the time, they began to, they were hiring young people as poll workers. And some of my older neighbors and friends got jobs. I guess they were 14, 15 years old. They got jobs working for um, Seoul or Coup. And I think they were paid like 7 or $10 a day, which was a nice piece of money in 69 for, you know, somebody 14 years old. So I first became aware of them then. And, um, you know, since my first uh, awareness of them was not uh, really in a, an electoral or leadership kind of consciousness, it was more that these, they ran a, an employment agency. And um, I guess that particular understanding of it is something that, you know, in some ways I carry to this day, that they function more as intermediaries, as employment agencies around elections and perhaps after if they're successful. Uh, were you aware uh, of the uh, the kinds of things the young people had to do to earn their seven or ten dollars mm -hmm. a day? Well, yeah, it was mostly kind of stand around. Um, the the um, the emphasis of uh, political organizations, I guess, in field organization and operations on election day, even to this day, is to um, stand somebody out in front of a a voting poll. Um, just outside the legal limit of 300 or 1,000 feet and to have them pass out a, a recommended list of candidates. And um, that's what I understood that these people had to do for their... Passing out literature. Passing out literature, standing on... Stand, no, not going through neighbors, basically standing on the corner. And, um, you know, even to this day, a lot of uh, the older traditional political organizations, that really forms the root and the backbone of their election day organization, that they'll have somebody standing out in front of uh, a polling place to hand out a piece of literature. Um, so that's what I understood that they did, but they never, I never really understood that they played a, um, at that time, that they played a role in dispensing favors after an so election. their political role would have been on or around election day. On or around election day. Before your cycle, mm -hmm. 
get paid for a couple of They'd days. They'd show up and you could get a couple of days of work. And that yeah. was it. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't any ongoing political connection? Not that I was aware of. I guess I became aware of that later, certainly before 1977. I guess in the, the mid-70s there was a lot going on because some of these uh, political groups had achieved uh, success or you know some of their patrons perceived that they had been successful so they may have been able to extract you know favors for um, their supporters or for themselves. It's an interesting characterization that the success was perceived by the patrons. Mm -hmm. uh, in your own view, what, to what degree were they successful? To what degree was it a perception that mm -hmm. made masks? Well, you know, that's an interesting question, but it's probably very hard to say because, um, you know, we really don't have a, a, a control group. We don't have any politicians, any white politicians in the post-voting rights era who were successful and who took some sort of risk and made direct appeals to African-American voters. Um, I guess the, you know, the resegregation in New Orleans that took place, you know, during the, the 20th century really made a lot of that less likely and more impossible. The uh, fact that um, black people and white people lived in less close proximity to each other in the, in the mid and late part of the century than they did in, a, in much earlier One time. One of the reasons I ask that is mm -hmm. that your father uh, pretty clearly ran the risk, although in his own mind it may not have been a serious risk, of uh, not cooperating with those groups on their terms. Mm -hmm. And that had to do, I assume, with his perception that the political risk, to him at least, was not that great. No, I don't think he felt that there was a political risk to him at all. Um, he had valid credentials um, and achievements working directly with the black community through the NAACP and through his work as a civil rights lawyer. and. You know, some of these groups who um, grew out of more civil rights oriented organizations, um, they, they may have not been totally successful in making a transition. Um, you know, some old timers suggest that CORE kind of lost its soul, not to strike a pun, that CORE may have lost its soul when they had the, the leadership fight in the, in the mid 60s. Um, and became less of a, an organization with civil rights credentials and with uh, relationships with people beyond an electoral sort of sense and something more narrow to benefit the leaders. So, um. Who do you see as being the most successful or responsible of the black political groups or leadership? Well. Um, I mean, if you're thinking of the traditional kind of alphabet soup, um, I would say that our organization, LIFE, has been one of the more successful. Um, and Congressman Jefferson's organization, while it's relatively new um, compared to the others, about 15 years younger, um, he's been successful over the last 15 or 20 years as well. Um, some of the other traditional alphabet soup groups like um, SOUL and OPPVL that were active in the 60s or 70s have been less so recently. Mm -hmm. uh, do you recall, uh, well, let me ask this a different way, mm -hmm. uh, going back to that first mayoral campaign mm -hmm. and you talked about your role in it, do you remember uh, where you were on election night and how you felt and what you saw or witnessed as votes were tallied? I remember less about election night and more about election day. Um, you know, by election night, I think I had been up you know, for two or three days with almost no sleep. Um, so I don't remember a whole lot about election night. We were at some trashy motel on Canal Street. And I think we had a room to change clothes at the uh, governor's house, which is now might be a day's in. It might even be a hot sheet motel now. And um, I think our election night celebration was at the Saxony uh, at Claiborne and Canal, uh, which was infamous, of course, for another reason related to another figure we just discussed. But um, I remember less about that night 
in more about election day that there were there was a, a great deal of activity and there were lots of people who unexpectedly came to help and we had more volunteers than we knew what to do with and um, you know really the energy on the street and the feeling that you know all of this work was going to be successful I mean and the this that sort of momentum is something that I really began to sense about a week or two before the race and um, then when my father had to resign his judgeship I think it was on November 5th maybe a week and a day before the election um, you know I really felt that that weekend we really closed on on DeRosa. Were you part of the get out the vote effort on election day? Yeah on election day in 77 we didn't really have a um, um, a sophisticated system based on um, uh, any kind of rich data. Uh, but we did know um, from our own polling and from some of the other polling that we could count on better than two-thirds of the African-American vote. And because of the residential sort of uh, patterns of de facto segregation, we were really able to target some neighborhoods on election day. and to be aggressive about it, not to just stand on the corner and, and hand out a piece of literature, but actually go to people's homes and knock on their doors and, uh, and ask them to vote and bring them to vote if they needed did, a ride. Uh, did public housing concentrations form uh, any of those target areas? Where yeah, they did, they did, but we had, done, we had done a great deal of work going back into the summer months in public housing, um, you know, especially in uh, desire, which at that time was the most populous, and I think had probably the lowest percentage of registered voters. So I know that we had done, and we had concentrated a lot on desire. Um, Lafitte and Iberville um, always had performed relatively well politically, and we knew that, and they were relatively small. Um, St. Bernard housing development was um, not a particular challenge, but um, Seoul had been active in Desire, and uh, Ku uh, was trying to build a, a beachhead in the St. Bernard housing development, at least in an electoral sense on Election Day. And so those were, you know, two of the sort of forces that we had to deal with. Ultimately, they were unsuccessful. You know, they had uh, lots of workers um, working for them on the payroll, but I doubt that they got many of the votes of the people who were actually on their payroll, much less anybody that they the workers were trying to convince. Would it have been much more difficult today, given the destruction of public housing and the scattering of population, to run that kind of a campaign? Is there mm. a I would say if we imagined a time when, like today, where public housing is not as concentrated, and, um, and imagine that we had the, the, the data that we had 25 or 26 years ago, it would be substantially more difficult. Um, but the access to data and being able to, you know, contact people and really, uh, to really kind of track your, your contact with a prospective voter is something that, you know, we began to develop right after that campaign. But it's, you know, it's a, it's a very scientific art now. I know later on in your father's administration he had paid private posters mm -hmm. and had a quite sophisticated information mm -hmm. gathering system. Mm -hmm. uh, you're saying it was much more... Operation. It was crude and rudimentary. We had, you know, um, we basically had an index card system. And we had a separate index card system for yard signs and for volunteers and for favorable voters. And it was, oh, it was unimaginable. It was by hand and foot. It was by hand and foot. And it was, you know, it was, of course, it was imperfect and nowhere near the standards that people would expect in the most rudimentary system today. It was, it was effective because, um, you know, comparably, I think it was better than uh, anybody had expected us. And even um, Nat Kiefer's campaign, which uh, by a lot of standards was the state-of-the-art campaign in 1977. He had, he had lots of money. He had professional phone banks. He had the best yard signs. He had lots of paid media radio. He even had a half-hour documentary about himself. This is going back to 1977. I don't know if you've seen it, but it, yeah. and um, I could won some film awards or something. It was so, such a great film. Um, but I don't know if it, it, if it did, him, did him much good. But he had, 
what what had to be considered at the time the state of the art campaign. Um, you know, he had walkie talkies and radios and you know, these were things unheard of in a local campaign at the time. We talked to someone on the other end, it was a precinct captain and it was talking about an uptown mm -hmm. uh, neighborhood off Claiborne. Um, um, who told us some interesting things about how organized he didn't know who was doing the mm -hmm. organizing, but he would get his number. He was supposed mm -hmm. to deliver seventy two mm -hmm. votes and he delivered seventy three and was mm -hmm. very proud of that. Who actually organized that? Well, we didn't really um perfect uh, that system until 82. Um, but it was a system of um, developed primarily by John Martilla, but it was a, a system that all of us realized we needed a system to not only track voters, but to commit people to, to the campaign. Um, so we solicited uh, from our base of supporters, we solicited precinct captains and block captains and as the block captains go out and knock on the door, write down the names of 10 people who are committed voters, write down their names and phone numbers and this was several weeks before the election and you know stay in contact with them and for the succeeding two or three weeks we had special materials that they were expected to deliver. So it was a system of developing um, um, a way for voters to commit to the campaign but also remaining in touch with them and gathering the information we needed to motivate them on election day. But you know, an added benefit that I think we found um, certainly in the 82 campaign was that it provided very valuable feedback on issues of policy. Um, and yeah, it, it was something that um, Dutch was determined, I think, in 82 when we began to get some of this policy feedback that a lot of the people who worked in City Hall that it was really effective and good for them to work in the field politically because they could be a, a whole lot closer to um, some responses and some public opinion on these policy issues and on issues of neighborhood development and what City Hall was doing. Um, especially some of the people who came from backgrounds, um, professional backgrounds that may have been a little bit different, um, who maybe had not been involved in community service or civic affairs or who maybe had not been from New Orleans. So we ended up, you know, there were lots of unanticipated benefits from it, for sure. We, we go on, going back to the neighbors, I think mm -hmm. it sounded like some of the voters were impressed mm -hmm. um, that you came back, mm -hmm. you know, they talked about that. They, they talked about um, how they, he was told, don't put a sign out in front because we're going to vote for Morial, but don't tell my neighbor mm -hmm. that I'm going to vote for Morial. Then they go next door to mm -hmm. the neighbor and the neighbor said, we're going to vote for Morial, but don't put a sign. Cause it was very interesting. That they it must have been the 14th Ward. <laughs> Um, we had talked to Larry McKinley a mm -hmm. little bit and uh, wanted to ask you about the impact of black radio mm -hmm. during the first election. Well, well, Larry McKinley's radio program was probably the single most important thing to happen in broadcast media that supported my dad's election. Um, more than any other single thing on television, his TV appearances were, of course, important. But Larry McKinley and um, Gus Lewis had a morning talk show, um, and this is in the 70s, and it was a very popular morning talk show, and it was, it was a variety. This is long before um, the universally popular Tom Joyner of today, who you know, has about 60% market penetration in the African-American community. Um, but they had a radio program that was a, a, a variety of news and talk and discussion, call-ins, and uh, music. And they really carried the discussion of the election in the black community each day. And um, I, don't, I don't know that there could have been anything to substitute for it. Um, it was almost like a, a daily sort of town meeting or a bulletin board where everybody could uh, be updated and put their two cents in about, about the race. And that reinforced your father's... Absolutely, yeah, it did. And um, he didn't appear on this program very often. Um, I think over the four or five months before he ran, he, he probably wasn't on more than a half a dozen times. Um, but it was a topic of discussion every day, every single day. And I'm curious, I wonder if any tapes exist of that, uh, of that show. Did he say? You didn't mention it. Jim Corbin has mm -hmm. television ads. Mm -hmm. but, um, Mm -hmm. Actually, he's, I don't know that there are mm -hmm. 
What station was that? That was on WNNR, um, 990. And I think it's um, called something else now, and it's, a different, of course, a different format. Uh, and it was on, I think, from 6 to 9 each morning. Does, does the radio still have that influence, do you think? Um, I don't think there's comparable programming, certainly not um, in, in this community. There's not, um, and you know, people have often speculated since that time what things would be like if there were. Um, Paid radio is very important now, but uh, as far as uh, call-in or talk or discussion programs targeted to the African-American community, are probably no more than three or four per week. It's certainly not a uh, you know, regular place uh, where people can go each day for this sort of information on a local level. So um, we've lost radio as a, as a, as a medium of discussion. Um, you know, the, the messages on radio now are all you know, pre-programmed and planned in advance. And, mostly paid advertising. I wanted to ask you about, um, when we were talking um, to Tony Mumford, mm -hmm. he was talking about the people brought into the campaign mm -hmm. in the earliest days before he was involved. He said, um, your father always looked for the best and the brightest. Mm -hmm. and what was that Harvard connection? Going back to, uh, if your father went up to Harvard right before well, he was elected? After my father was elected, because he was required to resign his judgeship. Um, and at that time, because of the electoral calendar, the transition between the day he was elected and the day that he would be inaugurated was going to be, I think, six months and two weeks. And um, he was basically without work. And he didn't think it um, really a, a good idea to practice law for six months. Um, so he became a fellow of the uh, Institute of Politics at the Kennedy School of Government and, uh, and worked and taught there for uh, a semester. He commuted, he spent a couple of days a week there and commuted back to New Orleans. And actually during that time he, um, he had another job as an analyst for WWL-TV. And I think he did um, a half a dozen um, commentaries or analyses on on urban issues that they ran in the middle of the night at three in the morning or something. Do uh, those exist? I'm I'm sure that they exist someplace because WWL is a great a great library. Yeah. We should find those those commentaries. So so there was supposed to be some program up at Harvard for newly elected mayors. Well, this was um, I think the very first his very first year at Harvard was the very first year they had a program for newly elected mayors, and that was one of the things that he worked on at the Institute of Politics. And um, each year there's a program uh, each fall for newly elected mayors at the end of November at the Kennedy School to this day. And he hired, and I think Tony Murphy hired some people from Harvard. Yeah, I think Tony hired several people from Harvard and, you know, um, and there's still people in city government today that, um, that came on board then. Um, Eugene Green at the Business and Industrial Development Center, mm -hmm. the old Almanaster Mishu Industrial District. He was a an IOP student of my dad's at Harvard back in in seventy seven. Any other questions? Sure. Yes, they are. Okay. <laughs> in general, um, after in the post civil rights era, mm -hmm. say after sixty seven. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a rise in black consciousness and mm -hmm. militancy. Um, how do you think your father, and even yourself, mm -hmm. how was it? How did how did you respond to it here in the city in, in New Orleans? Well, I I think that it was less pronounced here in New Orleans than it was um, elsewhere. Uh, you know, New Orleans was able to navigate the civil rights era without any major violent explosions. And I think that um, as a result of that and a lot of other things going back in the long history of the city, that we had always been a little bit late to realize a lot of these things. And so we were aware of it, you know. We you know, read all kinds of interesting books as, uh, as teenagers during the, the early and mid-70s. Um, but 
you know, I think that we understood that there were still some very fundamental and basic challenges here in New Orleans, you know, some of the electoral challenges for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't something that um, we really became, you know, conscious of in, a, in an overt kind of way. Mm -hmm. I have one question. When, you, when your father was running mm -hmm. the first time, did he get um, phone calls from uh, national candidates and national people who had been elected in mm -hmm. different places? Oh, yeah. When he ran in 77, he got um, calls and support from people like Gary Hatcher. Uh, in, and he said, help. I mean, um, Richard Hatcher in uh, Gary, Indiana, mm -hmm. and uh, Coleman Young in Detroit. Um, but um, we got lots of unexpected and generous help from people around the country. I mean, it was really, um, Maynard Jackson had been elected a few years earlier, but this was really a, um, a big barrier to elect a second African-American mayor of a majority white city in the Deep South. Um, so in a lot of ways, it was a, a, you know, a shared sort of challenge that people were willing to help us with. You had also done some political work uh, up in Chicago mm -hmm. for Harold Washington, I believe. Yes. Uh, how would you compare the uh, political experience or the political landscape mm -hmm. uh, in those two cities? Did working in New Orleans or coming from New Orleans help you in Chicago, or was it just uh, two very different places? Yeah, it's two very different places, but my experience in New Orleans, especially in the um, 77 and 82 campaigns helped a, a great deal because in a lot of ways uh, Harold Washington was facing the same sort of challenge. He had to um, rise above um, uh, skepticism in his own community and among his own base and he had an entrenched patronage driven system of um, you know black political organizations, ward organizations in Chicago just like we had our alphabet bed soup here. So, the challenges in a lot of ways were similar. Chicago politics is, you know, is much more different. I mean, uh, um, the, the patronage machine in Chicago is something that, um, you know, the editorial writers here in New Orleans, if they really thought about it, would shudder the way they throw the word around patronage. But, um, you know, Harold's campaign was uh, the same in that he had um, a similar sort of relationship with the prevailing uh, political overlords. Um, Harold came from out of the machine, but you know became a reformer and fought against him and beat him. And in a lot of ways, um, you know, my dad really didn't come out of the political machine in that sense, but he came out of a, a political tradition um, and really had to, you know, fight some of the the newer expressions of that tradition, I guess, um, in order to be successful. Do we have any other? Did you support his bid for a third term? Whose bid? Your, your father. Mm. The question was, did he support his bid for a third term? Well, he had two, and um, I thought that it was fundamentally unfair that, um, you know, the term limits really just as a matter of philosophy, undermine the choices that a voter has. And, you know, I guess my philosophy on that is in some ways shaped by my family experience, but I've always, I've always felt that way. So. That would have been a big difference with Chicago and Harold Washington, who had the expectation of serving. Serving until America. he was 80. Yeah, serving until he was 80. And I mean, I, you know, it's interesting to imagine um, how much sooner another candidate like Harold Washington might have been elected had there been term limits in Chicago, had there been a natural sort of turnover every, every eight years, or perhaps maybe he never would have been elected because there would have been, you know, stronger um, candidates in waiting, yeah. you know, waiting their turn. Or somebody that would have been there until they were 80. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Thank you very no. much. Thank you very much.